discover. Go recover. The word is gone forth. It is time to go forward. Double doors of opportunities will open as we advance to take new territories for the Lord. There will be a new passion for God and His dealings as we press deeper into Him. There will be productivity in every area of our lives, in businesses, in innovation, and in ministry. We will progress as we engage our communities and our world with the power and love of God. Families will not be left behind as we build legacies for the future. It is time to move. It is time for opportunities. It is time to do great things. 2020. Our time to advance. Get ready for the Word of God as we welcome the Senior Pastor of Fruitful House, Reverend Albert Osai Okuna. Good evening and welcome to tonight's service. Welcome to church. I'm so glad that you have availed yourself, so your, your, your homes and your heart to hear the Word of God. When it comes to teaching, we need to absorb the Word of God. So I'll encourage you to take a pen, uh, get a notebook, get your Bible, get yourself ready as if you are already in church so that the Word of God will have expression in your heart. Let us pray. Father, I'm asking that your Word will enrich your people. May the entrance of your Word give light. Illuminate your people, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And uh, I'm glad that you are alive. In these times, the most precious gift we have is life. I want you to take that very seriously. Your health is important because life is very important. I want you to keep safe. Follow guidelines on how to keep safe. Wash your hands. Social distancing. The issue is that they are not just saying it. Those who disobey those rules, it has become very detrimental to them. And stay home as much as you can. And for those who are doing essential services, God bless you. May the Lord protect you as you go out there. Since we started broadcasting to you, I've explained to you that we are here to help you. If you are in need, I don't want you to struggle alone. I don't want you to be home uh, thinking that no help is coming. We want to reach out to you, whatever area we can. And so don't struggle alone, don't suffer alone. We are just a phone call away. You can call our office number. You can email us. COVID-19 help at fruitfulhouse.com and we'll rush to your aid. Also, we are helping seniors in our community. We are reaching out, doing grocery for them. We are also helping them to uh, send medication to them. I, I wish you can sign on if you are well and able and if you can do it. I know this will go a long way to help somebody. So now let's go into the word. And I hope you have your Bible. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to recap on where we started last week dealing with spiritual gifts. The understanding we had from last week that the, uh, the manifestations of the Spirit is given to each one to profit all. 
And I will read from the New International Version for emphasis sake. The way it is in place in the New International Version gives a better clarity. So work with me. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And so, we're going to go back and pick it one after the other. The import of my message to you last week was that God gives gifts. God the Father gives gifts, the Son gives gifts, and the Holy Spirit also gives gifts. Now, we are recapping from last week. The Father gives universal gifts. It's for everyone. It is fixed in your DNA. You are born with it. You hear people say, this person is gifted. It doesn't matter whether the person is a believer or non-believer. God endows us with gifts. And so that is what the Bible is speaking about. There are different kinds of working. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are different kinds of workings. But in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God. It is the same God. God. It is the same God. That means God gives us the ability so that we can work. God gives us this ability so that we can use it. Eventually, we will stay on the gifts of the Father. Today, I will stay on the gifts of the Spirit. But I want to show you again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts. The Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, service, service. That is what the Holy Spirit gives. Uh, the, 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 sorry, God the Son gives service so that we can use it to serve the church, service to serve the church different kinds of workings we can use it to work verse 6 different kinds of work but in all of them and in everyone it is the same god at work the same god at work the same god at work then now to each one of us verse 7 Is giving the manifestation of the Spirit. And this is where tonight we're going to study. Remember, you can ask questions. You can throw your questions out there um, by whatever platform you are on, Facebook, um, Zoom, wherever you are that you are watching us, whether on our site, whether on YouTube, just ask the questions and I will answer. I'll try as much as possible to answer them for you. Now each one of them, now each one, the, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, for the common good. And he's speaking specifically for the common good of the church at large. We're going to deal with prophecy. The office and then the practices, prophecy. One of the most known gifts to the body of Christ is the prophetic gift. It is one that is so desired. It is intriguing, it's exciting because it seems to get deeper into a place where not a lot of people will know. 
It's like they have another eye to see beyond the physical. Because of this, the church draws to it. The world draws to it. And that is the place where there is a lot of abuse. My work tonight is to make sure that you have some level of understanding of what prophecy is all about. And to also to differentiate the office from the practice. When it comes to the office, the office is given by Jesus Christ. The practices is given by the Holy Spirit, by what we just read in 1 Corinthians. All Christians can operate under the spirit of prophecy. Every Christian can prophesy. It is for our common good. It is a means of God communicating to us. Prophecy is just bringing expression to the impressions of God. So God is placing an impression and then we bring it out. That is what prophecy is all about. It can come through so many means. One of the things I want us to address, write it down, is that it is the word that God is bringing to mankind. So anything outside the word of God is not prophecy. If I sit down right now and assume something and I tell you, even if it is right, it is not prophecy. It should be initiated by God. If I do that, it's called guesswork. When it is from God, it is prophecy. The second thing you have to think about also is that that word must be tested. So the fact that I walk to you and say, well, this is a prophetic word unto you, doesn't mean you should just swallow it. When you receive any word, you have to test it by the word of God. How do you do it? You have to make sure that it is consistent with what the word of God says. And so if it is contrary to scripture, then that cannot be prophecy. I hope you understand that very well. Prophecy is not for attention. Prophecy is not to make you feel or trying to make other people feel inferior or you trying to feel superior. It's not for attention. It's for common good. It's supposed to help. It's supposed to bless. It's supposed to build. It's supposed to change. Prophecy is never supposed to be for private consumption. You know, since I started speaking, I've not mentioned anything of giving people direction. That is not prophecy. If I'm giving you a direction, that is not prophecy. There is a difference between prophecy and somebody giving you the direction. Pastor, what does that come under? I don't know. If it's direction, then it's direction. But prophecy is what God wants you to know. And he speaks through human beings. He gives them impressions and they bring out expression. I want us to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7 and 8. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for common good. 
I want you to keep that in your spirit. Is giving for common good. Is giving for common good. Keep that in your spirit. For to one that is giving through the spirit a message of wisdom. So one is giving a message of wisdom. Uh, let's use the New, New King James, I think, uh, New King James Version. So the spirit can give us a message, a word of wisdom. The same spirit can give somebody the word of knowledge. And it's by the same spirit. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. I'm reading from the King James. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. So the Holy Spirit also gives gifts. That's what we're going to dwell on tonight. What the Holy Spirit gives. Now, if you hear broadly, when somebody's saying spiritual gifts, what normally comes to our mind is the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. And so when somebody mentions any other thing, sometimes we get confused. But that is not a spiritual gift. Every gift that is given to you on scene is a spiritual gift from God. Every gift that is given to you by God is a spiritual gift. But they are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts that specifically is given by the Holy Spirit. And this is where the Bible is mentioning. Word of knowledge. Word of knowledge just means maybe you see a situation and then you are able to, you know, say it. Jesus at the well spoke to this lady telling the woman all her history, her past life. The woman was so amazed, went back to the town. The Samaritan woman told them, I've seen a man. Word of wisdom is when you bring a solution. You see solution in any problem. That is word of wisdom. So word of wisdom is when you see a solution in a problem. And one example is Joseph. Egypt, it, uh, Egypt is receiving some impressions they don't understand. He says there's going to be famine. He interprets what they are seeing. But then he brings a solution. That is word of wisdom. You receive it and bring solution in a situation. There are some like discernment. Discernment is... Being able to know the difference between a bad spirit and a good spirit. So a bad spirit and a good spirit. Discernment is you, 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 you enter a place. You are able to know this, pla this person is from God or that person is not from God. There was a, one of those examples in the Bible where Paul has been in the town some uh, lady is walking behind her, telling her, oh, these are men of God, listen to them, they are of God. Paul had to cast them demon out of this young lady. Why? Because although he was saying all those nice things, he had a, she had an ulterior motive. She is not from God. But Paul was operating under the word of knowledge, uh, sorry, discernment. She was, he was able to discern that this is not from God, and they cast out that spirit. Now watch it. When it comes to discernment, you got to be careful. Discernment is not the spirit of suspicion. It's not negativity or legalism. You look at somebody and says, well, the way I look at you, I think there's something wrong with you. No, no, no. It's not what is in the outward. It's the Holy Spirit ministering to you. Because sometimes not all that glitter is gold. We have also some of the gifts as insight. Inside, they will see the soul. They will see into the soul of a person. A lot of it. Word of knowledge, visions, dreams. And so the Spirit gives specific gifts. Now, where I'm going to combine this 
is that I want to speak to you about prophecy in general. So I will explain to you, as I'm explaining to you this gift, the office of the prophet. I've already told you the father gives gifts. It's a universal gift. So people can walk around with that gift and the ability to see beyond. Their systems are made ready for it. Now, what if the person doesn't worship God? Well, then they can still see in the realm of the spirit, but they become uh, clairvoyant, they will become palm readers, they will become, you know, so many things that they can do. If that is why you have to understand that if somebody is seen in the future, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is speaking to that person. Last week, I tried to explain that to you. The fact that they can see your future doesn't mean that God is speaking to them. It means that maybe they are misusing their gifts that has been given to them. Because those gifts are very uh, universal gifts. You see, God knows us. He prepares us. He told Jeremiah, before you were born, in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you. I prepared you for what I'm doing. Let's assume Jeremiah, who has his own free will, refused to work with God. There's a possibility that he will see things in the spirit. But Jeremiah would have been a palm reader and not a prophet. This is a very important point. The fact that somebody sees in the spirit doesn't necessarily mean that God is in the person, with the person, or working for the person. It is so, so important. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. I want to give you the broad umbrella by under which prophecy works. This gift is so unique. This gift is wonderful. Now read from the New King James Version. But he who prophesies speak edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Prophecy, when somebody is prophesying, through the gift of prophecy, three things we are looking at. Whatever they are speaking should edify. Number one, write it down. Number two, it should exhort. Number three, it should comfort. Edify means it should strengthen. It comes to strengthen or energize. Edify means you are being strengthened. So when prophecy comes to you, it should energize you or strengthen you. Number two is to exhort. Exhort just means it encourages you. In these t difficult times, when prophecy comes to you, it will always come to encourage you. Number three is to comfort you. Comfort just means it makes you feel better. It consoles you. It speaks hope in every situation you are in. So three things that prophecy is meant to do. It's supposed to edify you. It's supposed to exhort you. And it's supposed to comfort you. Edify exhort comfort you when the impressions of God come into your spirit those impressions are supposed to be released number one to edify strengthen or energize somebody exhort encourage somebody and then number three to comfort which also means make somebody feel better this is the work now that I've, I'm speaking to you about those expressions um, of, the, uh, of, of prophecy, I wanted to speak a little bit about the office. Because I've been, so far I've been speaking to you about practices. This is how it works. This is how it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is the outcomes of the, 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 the uh, prophecy. But I want to pause and show you another aspect because there is the office of the prophet 
and also the practice or the operations of prophecy. The fact that I prophesy doesn't mean I'm a prophet. It means I'm operating in prophecy. And this is the practice of prophecy. It doesn't make me a prophet. Let me give you a simple ex example. To every parent, now our children are home. Some have to teach them. Some have to help them with their, their work, their assignments, because now most of the courses are online. The fact that you are helping your child doesn't make you a teacher. You are teaching, but you are not a professional teacher. Most parents give medication to their children, and I hope you are not just self-medicating, but you are giving what the doctor has prescribed and the pharmacist has given. And so, well, when we go take it from the pharmacy, we bring it home. And then maybe the doctor will say one teaspoon every six hours or five milliliters every 12 hours. So we measure it and we give it to the child. It doesn't make me a doctor. The fact that I took the medication home doesn't make me a pharmacist. I may be operating as a nurse at home, nursing my child's um, wound. That doesn't make me a registered nurse. So I cannot walk about saying that, well, I'm a parent. So I'm a doctor. I'm a pharmacist. I'm a nurse. I'm a teacher. I'm a counselor. Yes, I may be operating in all those things, but it doesn't make me, it doesn't give me that uh, ability to operate in that office. Because when I leave my home and I go to my doctor's office, I cannot send my credentials and say, well, I looked after my children, and because I looked after my children, I can work at this practice. No. It's the same with prophecy and the office of a prophet. It's very important. It's so important for you to get this. It will heal the body of Christ if we have this understanding. Sometimes I prophesy, I am not a prophet. Can God call me as a prophet? Maybe, but as we speak now, the fact that I prophesy doesn't make me a prophet. Now let's talk about the umbrella of the operations of prophecy. The first one is the word of prophecy. So there are four categories here. Word of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy, number two. So number one is the word of prophecy. Everything that is coming out is grouped under these categories. Number one, word of prophecy. Number two, the spirit of prophecy. Number three, the gift of prophecy. And these are the ones that I've been speaking on since I started, the gift of prophecy. Number four, the office of the prophet. And I'll, I'll explain them, I'll pick them one by one and explain them. Number one, word of prophecy. Number two, the spirit of prophecy. Number three, the gift of prophecy. And then now the office of the prophet. Word of prophecy. Word of prophecy is all God. It's everything that God is saying. It's pure, unadulterated. I'm going to read one um, uh, Bible verse for you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
knowing this first, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Word of prophecy is the pure, unadulterated word of God. And so, how does it work? I can pick the Bible and then read scripture and prophesy to you. I just open scripture and I open Psalm 23 and prophesy over your life that though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil because God is with you. That is the pure word of God. Because sometimes God will give you an impression to send a Bible verse to somebody. That is also prophecy. Sometimes God will tell you or sometimes some word will come into your life in a certain situation and the word of God will become so fresh because I told you for three things, it comes to edify, it comes to exhort, and it comes to comfort. And God releases this word and the word comes to you to edify, to exhort you, to comfort you. Yes, so you can pick the Bible and prophesy. I think it's the safest way to prophesy because we can test prophecy by the word of God. So if it's coming through the word of God, that will be the safest bet. Now watch this. As I'm speaking, I want you to understand that I'm not saying that just walk about, pick the Bible and tell people I'm prophesying to you. No. If you want to read the word of God to somebody, says maybe, you know, I feel strongly I have to read this verse to you. There are times that somebody need a word of encouragement. But sometimes also, there'll be a prophetic outpouring through your spirit, through the word of God, to speak to somebody. And when God gives you such a prophetic word to give to somebody, just go straight to the point and give it. This is not a time you make all those wonderful things. Ah, oh, the father said, no, no, no. You just go, give the word as is. And God himself will do the rest. Sometimes the things we add to prophecy make it so interesting. But prophecy can be that simple. As a matter of fact, sometimes you can get a word, you write it down, you send it to the person. That's how prophecy can operate. It's also prophecy. Number two, the spirit of prophecy. So we dealt with the word of prophecy when the Holy Spirit gives you impressions of the word of God that you can release to somebody. Number two, the spirit of prophecy. I'll read from Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. At this I fell at my feet. John the Revelator is speaking the word of God. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy bears testimony of Jesus. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he wouldn't let me. Don't do that, he said. I'm a servant just like you. Talking of the angel whom he had an encounter with. And like your brothers and sisters who hold to the witness of Jesus. The witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now let me explain how the spirit of prophecy works. The spirit of prophecy works in the atmosphere. Is the atmosphere created. Maybe you've been in a service and then the spirit of prophecy just began to move over the place and you started having impressions. You started saying things that you realize, whoa, this is not me. This can be God and God alone. 
because the spirit of prophecy is operating in that dimension. In 1 Samuel 19, there's a story about Saul. And Saul had entered into the atmosphere of a prophet who's called Samuel. When he entered that atmosphere, he started prophesying. Now watch this. He was prophesying. Saul had gone there because he was looking for somebody to kill. He was looking for David to kill. He didn't go there to go, he didn't go there for church. He didn't go there to worship God. As a matter of fact, I think he was crazy because he was naked at that place. He was totally naked whilst he was prophesying. But when he went into that atmosphere, a crazy demon-possessed man started prophesying because when you enter into such an atmosphere, the spirit of prophecy is released. You can also prophesy. It's very important to understand this. Again, that means the fact that you are prophesying doesn't mean that the spirit of God is on you or in you. There are two separate things. In these our days, when we hear people prophesying, then we make it final. Once they are prophesying, that means the spirit of God is in them. No, that's not how it works. Because when it comes under the second category, which is the spirit of prophecy, when the spirit of prophecy moves in a certain way, at a certain place, everybody there can prophesy. It's very, very important to have that in your spirit. There are two types of anointing, and I want to speak about it. The Holy Spirit can indwell somebody. Maybe the, 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 the grace of prophecy or the anointing of prophecy is in the person. So it, it can indwell the person. The person is a prophet or they prophesy by operation is in them. When it resides in you, that is where you can transfer this level of grace or anointing on somebody else. When you are operating under the spirit of prophecy, you can't. It's called the anointing on you. You cannot transfer the anointing that is over your life. Because Saul was prophesying, but he couldn't transfer any prophetic word to anybody. There is a big difference. I'm going to take one social media question. I know your questions are in. Say, how do you reject a prophecy that is not bringing you comfort, exhortation, edification, without being defiant? Great question. So I've received a prophetic word and the prophetic word is not comforting me, it's not exhorting me, it's not edifying me. What do I do? Because many a time, I think we've schooled ourselves wrongly that when there's a word of prophecy is supposed to scare us, make us confused, Disturb us, that is not what the Bible is saying. There is a dimension of the office of the prophet which comes to correct, which I will explain to you. But how do I reject it? Whether when a flyby prophecy drops in my drop box and it's not edifying me. I think it's just simple, be polite and say no thank you. Be very polite and say no thank you. And that's why we need discernment. Because if you have discernment, you will know whether this is from God or not from God. If I came to prophesy over your life, and by the time I left, you are confused, your house is in chaos, your marriage is imbalanced, your children are all you know, in a chaotic situation, that 
is not a prophetic word to you. Especially when you are born again. Most especially. It's supposed to bring comfort. It's supposed to bring education. So what you do without being defined is that sometimes also depending on where the prophecy came, you could be quiet and walk away nicely. But if this is straight up devil messing up, you know this is not from God. This is the devil throwing something at me, calling it prophecy. Because you see, there are people who are walking about calling themselves prophets. And by, maybe if you have the spirit of the same, and you know this is not from God. If you know that straight up, reject the word. Reject it. You can say, I refuse it. It doesn't make you defiant. Because if somebody walked to you and said, well, very soon, all your children are going to die. I would want you to reject it from everything that is in you. Pastor, what if it's true? You see, this is the God we serve. When God speaks to my heart and God reveals something to me, if it's from God, it sits with your spirit. You feel comfortable because the word has been spoken to me. Because, you see, when it comes to prophecy, it's not just for the one who is releasing the impression, it is also for the recipient. Remember, when God sent Noah, uh, no, sorry, Jonah, to go to Nineveh and prophesy to the people, he says, I'm not going, because I know when I go and speak the word, it will sit with them. And when they sit with them, they will change their mind, and you, God, you forgive them. You see, when the word of prophecy is from God, it will sit with you. No matter how your body knows, it feels, you know, no matter how hard it is, it will sit with your spirit. You will know this is God speaking to me. And so that is how you do it. I hope I answered it. I know I have another question from social media. So I think I'll take that one as well. How do you recover from a prophecy that tore you down in the past? And you just can't rise since that word came. I'm sorry to hear that, but that is the reality. The sad part is that the church itself can be a place that this can happen. And that is why we need to learn about these gifts. So that we don't abuse it, misuse it. Because it can mess somebody's life up. Don't think you just gave a word. Because word is life. Word has a spirit that backs it. And so, somebody can give you one word. And break you down. Destroy every confidence that is in you. Make you feel useless. Now, before I touch on this question... And for those of you who have those impressions of the, pro the gift of prophecy, please be careful. Be careful. Walking around telling people you are a witch, you are a wizard. Because you know what? A kingdom divided against itself will not stand. And when the devil knows that somebody is rising up, the best way he can do is just go call them a witch. You got to have discernment You've got to be able to discern what is from God and what is not from God. Now, if you're not sure, ask somebody, a pastor, a prophet, who, who knows what they're doing. I, I don't know how to put the title aside. So, go to a man or woman who is matured in the Lord. I want to put the title pastor aside and teacher and whatever. Because now people have put on so many titles that you don't know which one it is or which one it's not. There are people out there, their names may not be anywhere, but they are strong in the word of God. They are solid, they are matured. This is how you recover. The Bible says clearly, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That means God 
is there to defend us when weapons are thrown against us, things that fly by day, viruses that we don't see. As we pray to God, weapons formed against us will not prosper. But the Bible says every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall condemn. So when words are released against you, it is not God who condemns it. It is now in your power, your jurisdiction, to lift up that word and condemn it. Open the earth and bury it. That this word will never, never surface again. In the book of Revelation, remember, the Bible says that the earth helped the woman. It was figurative, a metaphor of the fact that when words are thrown, we can open the earth and bury those words. And so you speak against those words, those words that are spoken against me. O earth, open up and swallow these words in the name of Jesus. When words are spoken against you, words that are, are following you, disturbing you, whether you receive those words when you were young or when you were old or in your prime, you can still speak, those, speak against those words. You command them to have no power over your life any longer. Words are weapons. Words create. So don't just joke with words. And so I think the best way is to pray. Speak against those words. Bury them. And after that, replace them. Now, if, if the word was, say that you are weak, so you start saying words that, I am strong. I am strong. According to the word of God, you quote the scripture and you say, I am strong. Are you, are you understanding? So whatever word was given, there'll be a counter word in scripture that you use, you speak those words because they have creative ability. They have the power to make it happen in your life. I hope I attempted answering this wonderful question. So as I was speaking, I explained to you that when it comes to the unction or the anointing or the grace of prophecy, there are two types. The one that goes over you and then the one that stays in you. Now, that is what differentiates the prophet from the fake prophet. Because the prophet has the spirit that dwells in him, the anointing resides in him. The prophet can lay hands on you and impart some grace upon your life. That is how it operates. Now, I started with the gift. We've done two so far. Um, the word of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy, and the third one is the gift of prophecy. I was talking to you about the prophetic ministry, the office, and the practices, the operations. The first one was the word of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy, which you just ended. The next one is the gift of prophecy. That is where I started everything, the gift of prophecy. It's a common gift, even to everyone. Everybody can operate in that gift because you can now have an impression from the word of God that you can speak it, you can operate under the spirit of prophecy where the atmosphere was right and so you were able to prophesy. Those gifts are called common gifts. When it comes to the gift of prophecy, it is confined to the church. Gift of prophecy is confined to the church. Pastor, what about those out there how do they hear a prophetic word? This is very interesting. It is supposed to come to exalt, edify, and comfort the church. And I'll come there to answer that question that I know is burning in your heart. What do I do to the outside world? It is a gift or the expression that you do because you picked something. 
God impresses on your spirit and then you release it. There is no need to go around in the church saying, thus saith the Lord. The Lord said, well, you can say that, but there is no need. There is no need. Sometimes I prophesy to people, I just tell them, do this and do that. Or I say, I just want to fast with you for two days. We're going to start at this time. We're going to end, and this is the reason why we are fasting. And that could be just prophet, a prophetic word that has come forth. I didn't need to go to them and say, that says the Lord. Having said that also, there are people who operate in a, a dimension of pro the prophetic who are very receptive to the spirit and they are made in such a way that even when the spirit blows in this atmosphere they feel it some of us whatever spirit blows we don't even feel it i don't know whether it's happened to you before you enter to, into a place and something is spooky you start having goosebumps something is not right you're not you can't put, put a finger to it that means you've experienced what they experience. Because there are some people when the spirit of God is moving, they totally can experience this. They experience it so well, they can feel God move. It moves their body. And so there is aspect of that. If, if that is not who you are, like my makeup is not that. So I, whenever the spirit of God is moving or speaking, I shouldn't behave like those who are operating in that dimension so god is speaking to me to speak to you i'll just release the word to you there are some the spirit will just maybe you know lift them they will go berserk some may fall down everybody operates differently but the normal one like you and i when it comes to the gift of prophecy when the impression comes you can just release the word of god now I'm back to the church. Never accept negative prophecy. That's the question I answered earlier. Never accept a negative prophecy. Church, listen to me. Never accept a negative prophecy. But pastor, what if it is true? Now let me explain this prophetic word to you. <laughs> Whatever is true, which is truth, comes from God. And he has a word to deal with anything that comes my way. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above what I ask or what I imagine or what I think. And so let's say, for instance, the devil has planned to kill me. There was an example in the Bible. Jesus comes to Peter. He says, the devil tried to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Jesus did not come to Peter and say, you, two days, you are gone. Are you beginning to understand how it works? Although Satan has planned to sift you like wheat, I prayed for you. And so, maybe you picked something about me. You picked that something wrong was going to happen. Was it God who was saying it? If God is saying, what is the solution to that problem? You see, so we go prophesy the solution. I begin to see how prophecy works. Because if you told me, if you came to me and told me that, you know, I dreamt and your house was lifted into the sky and was flying all around and everything was helter-skelter, what do I do with that message if you realize whenever god spoke in scripture he gave the people what to do if my people who are called my, my name will humble themselves seek my face you repent you see he tells you what to do you don't just prophesy to somebody and leave them in a limbo where they are terrified and they don't know what to do i don't think that is the god we serve the God we serve says even when temptations come to us, there is a way of escape. He will always make a way. God is always trying to bring us back to him. 
So he will give us an avenue. This is what you do. This is what you do. So if God is impressing things on your heart, don't take a half statement and go terrify a poor family. The reason why I'm teaching you this is that that is why what the occult people do. If you go to a fetish priest, because they operate under fear. God operates under faith. God is bringing faith in you. Even when you, in the times of old, giving you examples, when he was about to destroy the earth, he made Noah to speak to them. If you repent, change your mind. If you do this, he kept talking to them. God will always give somebody an avenue for repentance. If he's going to use you. Remember the time that Abraham was negotiating with God concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. What if you find 40 people? What if there are 10? You see, as a prophet, or as somebody who prophesies, operates in the gift of prophecy, if God gives you a message, get the full message because it will be a blessing to somebody. Now, this gift of prophecy also has got nothing to do with the unbelievers. I'm coming there. It has nothing to do uh, with meddling in politics. It has nothing to do with that. Or soccer. Well, there are so many Christians who support um, the, the, the conservatives and so many Christians support um, uh, our labor government. So, where does God stand? God doesn't play politics. He will just put a man there or remove a man. Or your soccer team is playing my soccer team. And we prophesy. Those are predictions. See, God has better agenda in life. He's looking for the human soul. That is so important to him. And so we shouldn't belittle the gift of prophecy to some of these um, almost unnecessary stuff when it comes in the context of what God is actually seeking when it comes to his kingdom. Be careful of talking of the future of the unbeliever. Be careful. Because they have just one future. And that future is God. And so if you want to tell them a future, give them that future. And if they refuse it, it's up to God, the righteous judge. He will know what to do. Don't go around and tell people, you, you are going to hell. No. Hell was not created for man. Man can choose to go there though. But prophesy the mind of God. Beckon them to go to God. And stop scaring people. It is abuse of the gift of prophecy. Now within the few minutes, I'm going to close. So I'm going to go to the fourth one, which is the office of the prophet. The office of the prophet. I will start and next week, I will continue the office of the prophet. Now this office is not one of the gifts that is given by the Holy Spirit. This is one that is instituted by Jesus himself. He gave those gifts unto the church. Remember last week, he gave some prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, prophets. It's supposed to edify the saints. It's supposed to help the saints. This, these gifts are supposed to train them for the work of ministry. So the office, office of the prophet is very, very different from the gift of the prophet. If you are operating under the gift of prophecy, don't walk about calling yourself a prophet. Prophets, a prophet is an office. I've met a few prophets and boy, you will feel the presence of God with them. You got to be called into this. It is a place of authority. 
very interested in that gate. As a matter of fact, sometimes they are very uncomfortable to be around because they are always turning your heart back to God. They are speaking the heart of God in purity and in holiness. That is one hallmark of the, the prophetic office. In the prophetic office, they are seers and then other prophets. Seers are prophets, but not every prophet is a seer. Next week, I'm going to explain all these office, you know, categories to you. They are seers and they are prophets. Some have other dimensions like dreams, but prophets operate in levels. You know, when you enter into that office, there are dimensions to it. You see, if God has called you into that office, you got to be humble and walk into this grace because there are levels to it. One big hallmark of the office of the prophet is that prophets are giving not just to the church, but to the nations. And so maybe you have heard a prophet prophesying to the nations. And then because of that, because you're operating in the gift of prophecy, you go to Facebook and start prophesying to the nations. I want to caution you because every level as you head already has got its devil. If you have the gift of prophecy, operate in it, in the confines of that gift. Because the things that those prophets deal with is something that I will talk about next week. The Spirit of God expresses in dimensions. And so you may see a prophet at this level. Another prophet at another level. In a dimension you've never heard nor seen before. In Isaiah 11, 1 to 3, I'll give you this illustration. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Lesson verse 2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and mind. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Look at the dimensions by which Jesus is being described that he's going to operate in. There are levels in the realm of the spirit. There is no single prophet that has known it all has been everywhere. Paul was shown a dimension of the third heavens. He was shown other things. Paul comes back and says, I don't even know. I don't have the, 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 the release, the, um, the go ahead to say the, the things I've seen. There are some dimensions when you go there. It's for your eyes only. That is why you need to grow yourself if you have been called into this office. It is a wonderful office, but it is, it is deep. Now, when you hit these levels, your authority gives you the right to correct and then direct to. Your authority will give you those two distinct outlooks. You are going to direct and you are going to correct. You are going to direct and you are going to correct. I remember when I was growing up, a prophet, a certain prophet will come to church. And that time when he comes to church, Everybody is shaking in their boots because he's coming to correct and he's coming to direct. Now, the fact is that you don't leave that place down. You leave that place edified. You leave that place with a repentant heart. You go on your knees. The fear of God enters into your life. Not the fear, just fear. You begin to see God 
as the holy God who inhabits our praises. I'd never sat under any true prophet that I got scared and my life got messed up. It rather brings you into perspective. It turns your heart back to God. You begin to want to love God more, pray more, read scriptures more. That is what the office of the prophet does. When they stand up and speak to nations, nations listen to them. And so we're going to just close with this. Acts chapter 21, verse 10. Acts chapter 21, verse 10. Now, I'm going to read it and we're going to find out some of these characters, some of these people. And then you will tell me what they are operating under. Whether they were prophets, whether they were operating the gifts of prophecy, or whether the spirit of prophecy was operating in them. Acts 21, I'll read from verse 9. Or just, let's go back a little bit, maybe verse 8. Verse 8. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist. So underline that in your Bible. This is our last verse, and then we're going to close, or I'll take some of your questions. Philip the evangelist who was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. The Bible says he had four children, four daughters, unmarried daughters, or virgins, they called them in those times, who prophesied. He had four who prophesied. And we stayed many days. A certain prophet called Agabus, came down from Judea, verse 11. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. So they started telling, you know, uh, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. But that's not the import of what I want to teach you. Verse 9, there were four virgins, four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Four. Now these ones were not prophets. They were operating under the spirit of prophecy. So all of them were prophesying. But then when we step in a little bit, verse 10, the next verse, the Bible speaks about a prophet. And his name was Agabus. So you, you, are, you, you are seeing the difference. He didn't call the, 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 the children of Philip prophets. The fact that they prophesied doesn't make them prophets. They were operating maybe under the gift of prophecy or under the spirit of prophecy. But Agabus was a prophet. He was in a different dimension. Now compare Agabus to Paul. Paul was also a prophet. He was not just an evangelist, an apostle. He was a prophet in his own right. He was in the office of a prophet. Now, if you compare the ministry of Agabus to the ministry of Paul, Paul is somewhere here, Agabus is somewhere here. There is a level, there's a dimension, there are differences in the office itself. I am a pastor. My general overseer is a pastor. But I'm a pastor, but he is a pastor of pastors. There is always a dimension. Dr. Franco Fusuapia is a pastor of pastors. 
He pastors so many pastors all over the world. The dimension he operates is different from the dimension I'm operating. In the same way, God will be picking you up and training you and lifting you to where he wants you to be. If the call is on your life, don't run. Maybe he's touching you with just a glimpse of what he wants to use you for. Like Samuel, serve in the house of God. It takes a long time. I explained to you the other time that the average it takes God to prepare somebody for these offices is about 30 years. About 30 years. Look in scripture. He prepared Jesus for 30 years and used three years to do his ministry. Timothy was called, but he served. And he was mentored by this same Paul. If God is calling you, there is nothing beautiful than a sharp gift. Learn the word. Stay under tutelage. Because the world needs this gift. But if you don't, it's going to be a sad thumb to the world. It's going to be an embarrassment to the kingdom. Stay focused. Stay in the word. I'll take one last question and then I'll close you to go home. Should a prophecy be given publicly or privately? Should it be given publicly or privately? Very great question. It depends on that prophecy. And is the carrier of the prophecy who should be trained themselves enough to know what to say and what not to say. I'm a counselor. People come to me for counseling. I cannot come to church and give an example of what they told me in private, even if I don't mention their names. But, for instance, they told me how God has blessed them and said you can use that as an example to encourage somebody, I can publicly say it. When God gives you the prophecy, you will know. Because he will download the information in your spirit. Imagine you give a prophecy and the prophecy destroys a family. That prophecy may be from God. Wisdom was not applied to it. So if it's a private matter, go to the people privately. In scripture, there were private prophecies that were given to other people. They gave them private prophecies as well. But then if God is saying, if God gave me a word, concerning COVID-19, that I'm going to deliver my people. That will edify, comfort, exhort somebody. I will openly say it to people. But God told me that your bank account is left with $2. I shouldn't make it a prophecy. That is not a prophecy. The reason why he gave you that word may be a private issue that you can go tell somebody. So it depends on the prophecy, and that's why as somebody who is prophesying or growing in prophecy, you have to learn. You have to learn, or else you will hurt and destroy lives. If it's a private one, if the Lord tells you to give it, you give it privately. I've had private prophecies given in public places, messing up people's lives. That cannot be God in action. I hope I answered it. I'll take a few more questions. Before I go, I think I have um, a few questions coming. What are the roles of a prophet called to the nations? Great question. When a prophet is called to the nations, they are supposed to bring the heart of people back to God. That's the end game. So whatever they are speaking, whether they are warning a nation, 
you realize that if you read scriptures, realize that when prophets are speaking, when they warn the nation, they give them the antidote. This is what you should do. Repent. 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 John the Baptist comes on the scene. He's preparing the way as a prophet, preparing the way for Christ. He told them, repent for the kingdom of God is here. He's supposed to prepare the heart of the nations. They may do it through so many things. There are some prophets we call evangelists. And if, when we hit um, uh, the, the office of the evangelist, maybe I will explain that further. But the prophet is to turn the heart of the nations back to God. All right, the next question. Is it, operate, is it possible to operate in more than one prophetic gift? Great question. Yes, you can operate in so many gifts of prophecy from insight, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Uh, you can operate in so many of them. There are some of you who have some of these um, uh, expressions of the prophetic, which is dreams. I've not spoken much about it. It's one of the greatest gifts. I always say, that, I always say this, that if God has given you that gift, you got to write down your dreams. I remember when, the, uh, about a couple of days ago, um, after prayer at home, one of my uh, children told me, Daddy, I dreamt about this COVID-19. Um, okay, I don't, I, I don't want to tell you what I wanted to do to that person. But if God spoke to you through a dream, he wanted to speak to the church. He wanted to speak to the world. You see, you may, you may think it may not be important, but remember dreams that people have had. Joseph. So those are glimpses of the prophetic as well. So you can operate in so many of those um, gifts. And many a time people operate in multiple um, prophetic gifts. Good question. Next question. If you operate in the prophetic, is it possible to have bad dreams about people? Of course. Of course. I don't know what you call bad dream and good dream. But maybe a bad dream could be you dreamt and um, the next door neighbor's cat is chasing you on the streets. The fact that you are a prophet does not take you away from every warfare that happens in the realm of the spirit. And what we may call a bad dream could be a very good dream anyway, if you have interpretation. For instance, let's go back to the same Joseph. I want us to narrow our examples. He dreams of a, you know, a lean, mean cow swallowing a fat cow. Honestly, in some cultures, if you see a cow, it's a witch. So he would have said, this is a, a witch. I dreamt, I saw a witch. It's a bad dream. It depends on what you're seeing. Or John the Revelator, seeing all these dragons and the rest. You may call it a bad dream. By his interpretation, God was warning us about the end times, the things which are about to happen. But let's, for, uh, teachings, um, for, for, for the sake of teaching, say you had a bad dream. Yes. Yes. Because most of the time, God will come to the prophet himself or herself and speak to you. As is. As is. This is the issue. This is where I'm coming. And unless we are talking of a bad dream as something that destroys your life, that, I will say, then we have entered into the level of warfare. Because the devil doesn't war us only in this realm, but he can war you in the realm of um, dreams, visions, in your mind, he can fight you. So yes, you can have bad dreams about people if you're a prophet. It could be warfare or God speaking to you and explaining something to you that you thought it was bad. I hope I answered this. The next question. What are some of the examples of a prophet correcting and directing? 
I thought I would have easy questions tonight. Examples of a prophet correcting and directing. So a prophet can walk into a place and warn them against worshiping of idols and tell them to turn their heart back to God. He can tell them, you know, why have you left the house of God in ruins and you are living in your wonderful uh, homes? He can tell us, don't sin. He can tell you, stop adultery, stop fornication. He can. A prophet is, the office of the prophet is there to correct. But one of the things about his office is that after he has told you what is wrong, he tells you what to do. In this dispensation, God doesn't just tell us that. He tells us what the, our state and then tells us what to do. And so examples could be that. Examples also could be, um, be speaking to us about our prayerlessness and directing us to read the word and keep in prayer, live pure for God. So there are so many aspects. Whatever the Bible speaks of, God can tell the prophet to speak to us concerning those things. So there are so many ways the prophet corrects. Next question. So can someone in the office of the prophet give me a word from God? That shakes me. That that might not immediately comfort me. Of course. As a matter of fact, that is the MO of the prophet, a modus operandi. That's the way they operate. When the prophet speaks, when the, the office of the prophet, it actually has to shake you in your boots and let you run back to God. This is how they operate. It's, the prophet is like the bulldog outside. That mom and dad has told you, don't go out, don't walk out, don't go, please don't go, it's dangerous out there, and you refuse to go. And so you walk outside, you open the door, and here comes the bulldog. So you, you shake in your boots, close the door, and come back home. You come back to God. You see, all that the prophet is doing, it will bring you back to God. It will not destroy your life. It will bring your heart back to God. Yes, their office is unique. Maybe you're asking this question because prophecy is supposed to comfort, exhort, and edify. Now, after the work of the prophet is done, these three will come in line with it. See, their office is unique. They operate in a different dimension of authority. They have the rod, and they have the staff as well. When you operate in the gift of prophecy, you have only the staff, not the rod. But they use the rod so well, it's like a parent disciplining their child. It's different from you trying to kill somebody. Because if you don't operate well in that gift, it will kill a soul. I hope you're understanding how I'm explaining it. So the office, they have that leverage. Because they are matured. They understand where God has placed them. They don't go back with their, go around with their nose in the air, trying to boast for everybody to know their prophets. They are living it. They are living pure. They are in line with God. They speak the mind and the heart of God. And they are so attractive. Although you are shaking, you still want to stay there forever. That's how the office of the prophet operates. Immediately, you may not find comfort, but eventually, you may find hope, comfort, exhortation, and love. All right, pastor, next question. Pastor, in this period of global panic of the pandemic, there's a lot of ridicule of faith and prophecy. Can you kindly address this? Well, let me tell you the other side also. The whole world is running to God now. Everybody is going to God. There is no hope anywhere except in God. I hear what you are saying, but I want to give you the general overview. You and I know that this pandemic is not going anywhere except God takes it out. For all that we are doing, our numbers keep going up. 
Our help only comes from God. In the time of Noah, they were ridiculing the ark until the water came from them. Some people are just sent by the devil to just destroy lives. But let's come to what is on the table. Some are ridiculing faith and prophecy for a reason. Because they are saying that why did God not tell anybody about this? I don't know which prophet they are talking of. Or maybe somebody who operates in the uh, prophecy that is calling themselves prophet. Because if you put your ears down to those prophets that God called. Because I've had a few of them also who prophesied this COVID-19. You know, one of God was saying it came from the sea, but it's coming. It's going to be a pandemic. A lot of people are going to die. He prophesied. Prophets spoke the heart of God. I saw a prophet in a village somewhere with a few congregations prophesying that there was going to be a pandemic, but people are going to put on masks. So yes, it's not the um, uh, showtime kind of men of God I'm talking about. I'm talking about those who are called by God. God spoke to his prophets concerning this. And the solution was for us to pray. But having answered that question, let him that radical continue radically. All that you have to do is to pray for them. Because COVID-19 is nothing to joke about and ridicule about. This is not a time to point fingers. This is a time for us to put our hands together. I mean, not literally. Distance, distance. But, you know, at a safe distance, figuratively, let's put our, our efforts together and help this world. Help our brothers, help our sisters. That's why in Fruitful House, we are out here to help the seniors in our community. It's not a time to sit doing nothing and ridiculing. If you have enough time at your hand, hold part of this work we are doing and go out there and help somebody. If, if, if you have the ability to or you have the permission to, if you've been told to stay indoors, just stay indoors. There are nurses, doctors, you know, uh, who are out there helping to save lives. If you have nothing to do, just go on your knees and pray. Pray for yourself and pray for your family. This is not a time to ridicule. It's that what the Bible said, that when in the marketplace they are buying and selling, the children are just playing. This is not game time. This is where we go back to seek the face of God. The, the issue is that those who say all these things, ask them what solution they have. They have no solution. As a matter of fact, I don't even waste my time on those. I don't read what they say. I don't look at what they say. I'm looking at those who are at the forefront of this battle, helping people. Those in the laboratories, trying to get um, a cure to this disease. Not those who just ridicule. Because you know what? They will ridicule faith anyway. Whether we are in a pandemic, epidemic, or no, no dick, no, nothing. You know, whatever it is. They, they will still ridicule the world. So you got to be careful about your ridicule. You got to be, you got to be careful and don't take in what the naysayers are saying. Look unto God, the author and the finisher of your faith. Okay. Wow, the questions keep coming. If God raises a prophet in the church who is not a pastor or a minister, should that person run the word to the pastor before going to the person? Great question. Yes. Yes, you have to. I pray that you have a pastor who understands some of these gifts. And I think most pastors do. But sometimes they need a safe environment because if you have a word and you run to the person, that may destroy their lives and make the issue worse. Let's assume this. Somebody walked to me just before church and they all maybe a day before church and they called me and said, Pastor, 
you know, um, I was fighting with my spouse and I need help. And then the prophecy came in. That's here, the Lord, you are fighting with your spouse, you need help. No matter how you explain it, say the pastor told you. No matter how. That's just one aspect of it. Number two. If somebody is not physically ready to receive a message, there should be a way that you break such a message to them. For instance, the Lord has told you somebody is carrying some type of disease and sickness. God forbid this person we are talking about has, you know, serious heart problems. And they just walk and say, you have this also. You may give them a heart attack just because of fear. If you get somebody wise that they can go to the person and say, you know, as we are checking your heart, maybe we should let your, your doctor check you as well for all these things. You know, you, you can break in the message slowly, nicely, that they can swallow it. The fact that God has sent you doesn't mean you just go and destroy lives. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Don't say, I cannot, I don't know what to do. I cannot carry this. I have to do it. I, no, don't do that. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Run to the leadership of your church, matured leadership, not just anybody. And say, this is what I picked up. You can, you can write it down and give it to the person. It could be your pastor. It could be, you know, but it's always safe to do that and say, this is what I received. They may pray about it. God will give them a confirmation. And then maybe, um, sometimes people tell me this, and after having a confirmation, I tell them, go and tell the person, because I know it's safe to go. If I see it's not safe, I may have to do it myself. And so that's it. I'll take one more question. Next week, come back, we'll have more questions. So I'll take only one, and then I'll pray for you. When a prophecy is given, and that prophecy does not come to, to fulfillment, what do you consider that to be? Good question. Good question. That means, what if a prophecy came, but it didn't come to pass? Let me give you one big prophecy that did not come to pass. Jonah. God told him, I'm going to destroy the living. The reason why Jonah refused to go is that he said when the people change their mind and then they turn their heart to you, you are a merciful God, you forgive them. Then they will laugh at me that you prophesy, look, it didn't come to pass. Now prophecy, the reason why prophecy comes, and we have to understand this, God reveals things to us for the purpose of redemption. He doesn't just throw things out there for throwing sick. When he told prophet Noah to tell the people that I'm coming to destroy this earth, repent, if they repented, there was, there was no need for the ark. And then he would have been a liar. That is the first aspect of it. Paul also told Timothy, somewhere in the Bible, if you find it, you can put it on for me. He says, every prophecy you receive, you war with that prophecy. The fact that you have received a prophetic word doesn't mean you sit down and say, okay, I'm waiting. Let's see whether God will bring it or not. If God doesn't bring it, then he's not God. No. The word of God comes to you and you have to war for whatever is given to you. Let me break it down in a way you can understand. Possibly, your parents, when you were young, told you that we can see that when you grow up, you're going to be a pastor, you're going to be a teacher, you're going to be a lawyer. They, they said some powerful things about us. I remember some of the things I told my parents I want to do that broke their heart. Because your parents who gave birth to you begin to see a glimpse of what the gift is that God has placed in your life. But if you refuse to school yourself, if you refuse to go to school, if you refuse training, you can never be what you were made to be. I'm called a pastor. 
If I refuse to pray, I refuse to read the word, I refuse to live right, no matter how much I've been called, it will not be fulfilled. And so, yes, a prophecy, prophecy comes, but you have to war for it. You have to pray for it. You have to ask God for it to be fulfilled in your life. When you hear the word, that is the beginning of the enacting of the prophecy. Think about it. When a prophet goes to a nation and tells them, if you don't turn your heart to God, I'm going to destroy this nation. If the people sit and do nothing, their prophecy will, prophecy will be fulfilled. But then they lost. In the other way, too, if you do nothing about it, the prophetic word may not come to pass. Let me give you this verse. It may help you. Psalm 24. It's a messianic psalm. Messianic psalm means it's talking about the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming to the world and look at the Father speaking. Psalm 24. He says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted, you everlasting doors, so that the King of glory will come in. You may think that God gave an order so the devil will keep quiet. He's asking, who is the King of glory? Then he says, the Lord, strong and mighty, so it's um, Psalm 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting Lord, that the king of glory will come in. This is, who is the king of glory? The devil is trying to tell God he doesn't know. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Then verse 9, he shouts again at him, lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors, so that the king of glory will come in. Even Jesus Christ, before he came on this earth. Although it's been prophesied over and over again, there needed to be warfare for those doors to be opened. You think about it. Even after he had come on this earth, his parents had to run with him to Egypt because it doesn't matter how many prophecies had come forth concerning him. If they didn't run away, Herod would, have, Herod would have killed him. Yes, there were prophecies about how he's going to die on the cross and the rest. At some point, just even at the point of his death, he was praying that I wish this cup will pass, but not my will. If he had said, I don't want to go, that's it. So prophecy has got dimensions. Part of it is you, the one who received the prophecy. And then the last one is this. The last one is some prophecies are also false prophecy. So no matter how you war, no matter how you pray, if it's not of God and it's not from God, it's not from God. God bless you and shalom. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm asking that your grace will abound on your people. As we study together, may the word dwell in them richly. For those who have this gift of prophecy for those who have called into the office of a prophet. Train them and equip them. The world need them, O oh God. The world need them, O oh God. Raise them up as an army on this earth for your church and for the world to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. And look, stay safe and support the work we are doing as well in prayer and with all your finances that you can support. We are out there reaching out to the community. We are out there maintaining this facility because we can't wait to meet again. When this is over, we will sing the song of deliverance. So they're going to tell you how you can support us, whether by PayPal or just e transfer us accounts at fruitfulhouse.com. We'll be glad to hear from you. Your prayer, your dedication, your support financially, physically, emotionally, is much appreciated. God bless. Shalom.
If you are in need of assistance during these difficult times, please don't hesitate to reach out. Please call 905-696-0050. The number again, 905-696-0050. Thank you.